Luke Evans. So you had a comfortable upbringing. Well, my father's a GP. My mum's a nurse and was a school nurse. Um, I was very lucky with the opportunities I was given. My parents have always been sort of aspirational and their big drive has been around education and getting my two brothers, three of us, uh, into you know doing as best as we ever could. Um, it did make tough times. We had to remortgage our house at one stage to be able to pay school fees uh, because things were tough. They got some bad advice. Um, and you know that made things difficult. But broadly speaking, I've been very lucky. If I was lucky to give my kids the upbringing that I've had, then fantastic. And tell us about the career that you pursue after university. So my university, uh, I studied medicine in Birmingham, and uh, you know thoroughly enjoyed it. And then um, 2008, 2009, I'd always been interested in being in A and E, possibly looking at that. But then got into the idea of medical leadership and making a little bit of a difference from that side. Politics had never been a thought that I'd ever have. Um, I ended up actually getting unwell in 2009. I ended up having an appendicitis and ended up on intensive care units because um, I got bilateral pneumonia. Only a medic would have the complications that we did. So that makes you think and say, well, nothing profound, but what can I do to make a bit of a difference? So I did my second year and then thought I got onto the GP training around Birmingham, but thought, Am I sure I want to do this? So I took a year out to uh, do anatomy demonstrating, teach medical students, first and second year medical students in Birmingham. And that's when I got the interest in politics because I was watching what was going on with an election and thinking, well, I do a lot in the community. I'm interested in that kind of side of things. How do I swap that over? Maybe it's something I'll explore. Um, and then GP came up and I thought, I'll do, that's the right thing for me. So I spent three years doing my GP training and then qualified from there and then have worked in multiple practices, both some as a locum um, and then some as a salaried doctor, all across the Midlands, uh, towards Oxford as well. And then even where I work, at, you know, where I work now as an MP. So that's sort of the, the history of where I've got to. Does the way that our GP service works, does it, is it broadly right? Did you learn things about how our GP are providing our GP services? where you thought, I oh, wonder if we could do better on X or Y? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think probably go back further than that. As a junior doctor was the real interest. When I, One of the reasons I was in politics was because I was always the person as a junior doctor who said, well, why do we do this? And the NHS would say to you, well, you're too junior to ask that question. We've always done it like that. Or what do you know? And you say, well, hang on, if I'm on the front line, the consultant's not going to know what's happening. Maybe we can make a change and a little bit of difference. So some people put their head down. I was always the one who said, well, that doesn't make sense. Can we do something about it? So yes, it gives you that insight. And I think going forward, that's really handy, especially when we've dealt with the pandemic, because you're able to offer some of the solutions or see some of the problems that you won't see in, in, in Westminster or Whitehall, because you know how the coal face works. Uh, and that's really, really important to be able to say, there's a balance here, or there's a trade-off, what are you looking at? So the, the classic example at the moment is face-to-face, -face um, you know, seeing a GP face-to-face. And the question you have to ask is, is it appropriate and appropriate to who? So it might well be that you've got a smartphone um, and you say, I've got a skin lesion. It's absolutely appropriate for me to say, would you take a photo of it? Send me in. Actually, no, this is clearly a mole. I'm not worried or I'm not sure. Come in and see me about it. But that's a change from what patients are used to. So they may be upset saying, I like to come in and see my GP. So you're caught between what's right for the NHS and prioritising over the clinical need versus what's right for the consumer, i.e. the patient and you know their right to, to have a standard of service. And that's a real constant rub, especially as we live in a society that demands more and more, but also is worried about how much they're paying for their taxes. So it's quite a hard balance to strike. And that's what you're seeing play out in the media with GPs, government, being an MP, and also the, the, the public as well. So it's quite an interesting battle. <laughs> and I suppose lots of people will be watching thinking, why is it that you have to like ring at eight o'clock in the flipping morning? <laughs> Do you know, were there any, was there anything, these are things that probably strike patients, but is, is there anything in particular that's, that, that struck you about the way that just we all use our GP service where you thought, hmm, yes, might so be I able guess, to work better? I, I guess there's a variety and it, it's really interesting. Different practices find different ways of doing things. Mm. And the best thing about general practice is patients learn as well. So you'll put a new model in of saying, let's say, okay, we'll move from phoning up to have a walking clinic, which works really well for the first three or four months. But then patients start going, ah, oh, well, instead, if I ring up, if I just walk in, I can get my appointment and get seen there. And suddenly you get more and more people turning up and walking in. So then you have to move your resources around. And this is the hard thing to explain to people in, uh, in Westminster is actually, 
it's not like a commodity of moving a box. Patients all respond differently. So you and I could both go into hospital with the same problem, appendicitis. Um, you have a fantastic time out within 24 hours. I end up with bilateral pneumonia and end up on intensive care unit. Um, and there's no rhyme or reason why that happens. And that's the biggest frustration for me in the NHS is some people will go in with the same problem and have Rolls Royce care and others will not ha you know, have problems along the way. And why is there that inconsistency when you're going to the same place? And that's the key thing to try and pull out and tease out. How touch and go was it for you when you were in intensive care? Oh, uh, I didn't, never thought I was going to die or anything like that. Um, but uh, I, it's quite unusual, let's put it this way, to have bilateral pneumonia as 27. Um, and uh, it's... So I was in, in, the, in the intensive care unit for about 48 hours. I was in hospital for about uh, 10 days and then off for a month or so afterwards because all the antibiotics and things they gave you cause bowel problems as well. There's something called pseudomemorous colitis, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, and the funny bit uh, about it was I was put in one of the side rooms and they kept sending medical students in to take your history about what's going on. And as a medical student, there's a formulaic where you take your history about presenting complaint, the history of the complaint, any medications, and then they come to your occupation at the end. None of them had twigged that I was a doctor, so they go through this great big long list until they get to the very bottom and then be mortified at the end when they say, well, actually, you're a doctor. But I was sat there in my boxes, not looking particularly great, unshaven, <laughs> going, well, he probably doesn't look much like a doctor at this point in time. But um, no, I don't, it was, I guess. I asked my, my parents and my brothers who came to see me, but I never thought like that. But it's interesting going, naturally, you think you could be dead at 27. You know, that if I was in nature, that would have been the, the case. Um, but bizarrely, I didn't think I'd be speaking about this, but it, I find death quite a motivating thing, actually, because you look back and say, well, what happened before? What have I delivered on this this earth? How have I made a difference? Would I be proud if, to, to have that read out at my funeral? What would that look like? Um, I, th I find that quite comforting, actually. Do you have faith? No. But you just... I'd love to. I genuinely would love to uh, on the basis that I think it does offer so much. Um, but no, I don't. Um, right, let's talk a bit about politics. When did you decide you were a conservative? Mm. Um, so I'm a, uh, I suppose I've never been political growing up or anything like that. Nobody in my family is political um, at school. I never paid attention to politics or anything like that. Um, I've sort of hinted at it at the start when I did my year uh, doing anatomy demonstrating. That's when the students were doing their exams, so the election was ongoing. And you started. Which year is it? Uh, 2010. 2010, so 2009 right. 2009 okay. to 10. Yeah. So uh, David Cameron walking around, Gordon Brown had had his uh, spat with uh, um, in the back of the car and been caught out. And I remember thinking, gosh, they do, you know, they talk to a lot of people. I like talking to, to people. Um, there's problems in the NHS, so I can spot that. I, play rugby. I you know, was a Rotarian and did stuff for the community. Actually, maybe I'm a bit interested in politics. So what makes me then decide where I want to go? Well, the positive side from being a conservative was about aspiration and meritocracy. And as you climb high, you have responsibility to bring people with you. Um, and then less so going towards the Labour. I mean, in recent years, there was a negative reason about, you know, even the connotation in the, the 2019 uh, election about for the many, not the few. That to me, that very statement was divisive. Hang on a second, you're automatically choosing one group over another. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, why don't we all have an opportunity to move on? And so I, I guess I fell more towards the conservative angle for, from that point. And it was about scratching an itch to say, well, I don't know anyone. How do I get into this? So I signed up and uh, met my local association and, and went off to uh, an event. And, and that was it. So you joined the Conservative Party Around 2010? Yeah, 2010, 2011, something like that. Yeah, so and probably Cameronite the, type. At the age of? Uh, God, what do I be? So round about 30, something like that. Yeah, yeah so. so yeah, that's quite... Quite no, quite abnormal in the political village, but yeah. quite normal to normal. <laughs> yeah, normal absolutely, think that. absolutely. So I'm always, you know, in all the you, you meet lots of people who are involved in politics. You can quote you which election that did this and what happened then, and I it's slightly above my head. So I do, you do feel it's slightly. Well, inadequate in that sense, but politics around politics, I'm much more about the doing of politics and you know trying to solve problems rather yeah. than the, the nuance behind it. Of course, you need that data to back it yeah. up. But. The kind of person you have described yourself, I think, I think it's probably a minority. I'm not saying like a tiny minority, but I think most politicians are from that 
oh, we, you know, we used to talk about it when we were growing up and I knew I was a conservative or Labour for these reasons. I started delivering leaflets at 10, yes. <laughs> you know, and I was the youngest councillor at da-da-da. But, um, yeah, I think it might... I think you, your type of politician may be in a minority. That might not be healthy. Uh, I, th I think you're probably right. I, that's my experience that people have had that graded experience back through. There are some who come at it later life. Um, and, you know, all my family say, God, are you mad? What, what are you doing about it? But then when I say, well, hang on a second, aren't we trying to solve some problems here? And this is a, a good thing. Because there's so many similarities between being a, a good local MP and a good local GP. Mm. Um, you know, solving problems, communicating. You're not a master of anything. So you're used to being uncomfortable dealing with experts and people who know much more about you in the opposite. And I find that's quite handy um, because you're, you're able to then... The biggest kick I get is about explaining things to people and saying, well, this is why it is, how do we solve this problem? Or well, then taking that information and feeding it back up the other way. And that's, that's really encouraging and something I really enjoy. And you have become a campaigning MP um, and your campaign uh, is, is body image. Yes. Talk to us, tell us in your own words why, what it is that you're concerned with and why it's important to you. Yeah, well, if I package it up, the, the short answer is I'm concerned about the way social media can influence the way we perceive ourselves, especially if we're looking at digitally warped images. So I grew up wanting, you know, I played a lot of rugby, liked to go to the gym, uh, you know, wanted to, to look good and always thought, well, if I was going to be on, you know, Baywatch or something like that, you might be able to get there if you ate the right diet, if you had the right coach, uh, you know, if you had all the money and all the time to train. Nowadays, though, with social media, that doesn't exist. You can make your biceps bigger, your waist really much smaller, just at the click of a button. And for me, that creates this warped world and warped sense of reality that no matter what I do, I can never aspire to get there. No matter how hard I train, no matter what I do, I'm never going to get there. And I think I started to see that in my clinical side with people coming in concerned about it. Two aspects, often women who were either overtraining or concerned about being too big, but then blokes who were wanting to bulk up and wanting to go to the gym or say, can you prescribe me you know, protein shakes or build up drinks because I just can't get the, the gains that I want. And so that's the aspect that's underneath it. And so I started to do the, the um, research into, well, there's 1.25 million people with eating disorders and 1 million people using steroids. So there's a big scale of the problem. And then as a politician stepping in, I thought, well, I'm passionate about this. Um, I have no idea how politics works. This is a good lever for me to try to see. It's something I think would make a difference. I think the evidence backs it up that it would. How far can I get driving this through? Thinking I fall at the first hurdle where someone will say, no, this is a nonsense idea or get laughed out the shop or close down very immediately. Um, and actually, it's been somewhere in the middle. You know, people say that's a great idea, but there's practical issues about how you resolve it, how you enforce it, what you look like. And working my way through those meetings with all the stakeholders has been fantastic over the last two years because it's uh, only a couple of weeks ago I was meeting with the Norwegian ambassador because they put the same law that I want to put in place in place over there. And you say, well, practically now, how do I do that? Where do I take it? But I never thought I'd be writing in Grazia magazine or meeting. Um, I was very lucky to have uh, James McVeigh from I'm a Celebrity in the Vamps support the campaign. And, you know, I never thought that I'd be meeting celebrities and doing this kind of stuff in, uh, as an MP. But it's how do you generate that? And it's a great learning process for me because I'm a learning by doing kind of person. So that's how it's helped to move the whole campaign into one direction, I guess. So I don't see myself as a campaigning MP, actually. I see it as part of just that's an interesting part. But all the other stuff you've got to do for your constituents is more important. Um, you know, making sure they've got the roads. We've got a zoo. We're very lucky to have a lot of money go into a zoo and those kind of things. So it's picking issues and problem solving, I guess. So you've talked about the really positive things that you can do when yeah. you're an MP. It's not all easy. Let's talk about um, constituency surgeries yeah. and how and whether you feel safe when conducting them. Uh, yes, I, I feel safe. Um, I can see why the risks. I'm very lucky to have a very good team behind me. And people often watching this will think about the MPs, but your team behind you is really important to make sure you've gone through the problems. I guess you step into Parliament and you see lots of people have been lawyers or experienced trade unionists or whatever dealing with politics as a gp you deal with people all the time that's what your day you know day to day bit so for me actually the surgery is one of the places i feel most comfortable in dealing with people even if you're dealing with the most difficult situations you can't you do much to, about i mean we lost sir david amos we lost joe cox we could have lost stephen Timms. it's 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 quite a high rate of murder. Yes, at, at, at attrition. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, and as I said, the team are very good. My police, I cannot fault them locally, have been at beck and call whenever I've needed them to come out. Um, 
I, I guess you slightly price it in, in the sense that you want to be out and about. I live in my constituency. I spend my time there. That's where I walk my dogs. My wife works just over the border. Because it's, that's, I've always been involved in my community and I don't want that to change. You just have to be a little bit smarter and you need your team to tell you, actually, Luke, that's a little bit, you know, make sure you think about this. But more dealing with the problems is people come to you because they want some help or someone to listen or to make a difference. And that's what I was doing in GP and that's what hopefully you do <laughs> now in, a, in an MP surgery. Or at least I kid myself that maybe that's the case. Dr. Luke Evans, thank you very much. I think that's one of our most positive interviews with MPs and that's, okay. that's good too. It's good to find happy, um, untraumatised uh, members of Parliament. Right. I'm glad that you're happy in uh, your role. Thank you.